Okay. So greetings all. Welcome. We'll get we'll get started now. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. This is the first of our Sussex Development Lectures of this term. And we continue the theme that we started last term on achieving the sustainable development goals, synergies, and tensions. Um, I'll introduce our speaker in a moment, but before I do so, I'll just remind you that next Thursday, March 14th, we're really lucky to have Peter Newell on his lecture on climate and development, a tale of two cities. Peter, you're here some, somewhere. So, tale of two cities, I said. <laughs> tale of two crises. Peter's at the university. Peter's at the um, University of Sussex across the street, but but is originally from from IDS. Today, we're welcome to everyone here. Welcome to those of you who are online. Um, today, we're really pleased to have Graham Smith. Graham's a professor of politics and director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the School of Social Sciences in the University of Westminster. He's also the chair of a very interesting organization called the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development. And I think that will be a bit of the theme of his talk, which will link issues of democracy to the sustainable development goals. Now, I'm really excited that Graham is here for three reasons, at least. Um, first is that the sustainable development goals, as you know, and I'm sure he will remind us, are meant to be universal. They're meant to apply to the UK, as well as all the other countries from which you come from. But oftentimes, in our this is the first lecture we've had in this series that's going to focus mainly in the North and mainly about the SDGs in the UK. And Graham was kind of apologizing beforehand that maybe he had come across a bit parochial when he talks about places like Wales. Ever heard of Wales? Okay. <laughs> and I said, actually, no, for those of us who work in international development, to talk about a place like Wales is actually quite exciting uh, to learn more about what's going on in our own country. Um, second reason I think this is really important is when we talk about the SDGs, we oftentimes link it to poverty or the environment, sustainability, the gender goals. Um, not much is said, as he will point out, about democracy, but goal 16 of the SDGs is all about inclusive, accountable governance, which links a lot of the work at IDS on participation and governance. So we really want to make that link. And thirdly, I'm personally excited because Graham Smith has been one of the real pioneers for years who I've quoted um, on innovative methods of participation for governance. And a few years ago, you had that wonderful little book, what was it, the 58 varieties? 57. 57 varieties, like the Heinz tomato ketchup. You had yeah. 57 varieties of, of citizen participation in deepening democracy. It's a great, a great little book, and we've actually never met, even though we've worked on similar things for many years. So, Graham, thank you so much for coming. Welcome. As usual, we'll, Graham will talk for 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. So please prepare your questions. So I'll actually start with a little story about the 57 varieties, actually, because um, these 50, um, I was working for the Power Inquiry, which was an analysis into Britain's democracy, and my, um, the, the director said to me, how many innovations have you found? And I said, oh, somewhere between 56 and 60, and he said, you found 57. Uh, and the reason it's 57, if anyone knows, and he wanted to use a, a baked bean tin, and Heinz baked beans has 57 varieties of herbs and spices, so I, I was told exactly how many, because that would fit with the marketing campaign, so there we go. <laughs> um, it is an pl absolute pleasure to be here. Again, um, you know, this is uh, particularly a pleasure because, John, as John said, John and I have never met, and yet have actually been writing on very similar terrain uh, and know lots of people in common and yet haven't, haven't been there. And IDS, I've, I've never actually been here, but as if you, if you read the report that, um, and, and other stuff I've, I've written, I've, I use a lot of the work that's come out of, from, from scholars and researchers here. As um, John mentioned, um, I have sort of two uh, affiliations here. One is my academic, which is the Centre for the Study of Democracy. Uh, which does what it says on the on the tin, and the other is a very long mouthful, which is um, a charity that I run, which is, I guess, where more, more, more of my political work, which is for the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development, and that charity very much 
The ethos of that is recognising that democracy is essential for sustainability, but equally sustainability is absolutely essential for the future of democracy as well, and looks at, looks at it from both, from both angles. And the material I'm going to be talking to you about today comes from both of these, these activities. Um, the lecture I'm going to start off with talking about SD, SDG 16, which is often overlooked with its focus, as John said, on building accountable and inclusive institutions. I then want to suggest that there is one particular challenge that democracies face that will affect the achievement of any of the SDGs. And that's what I want to talk about is, is, short, is the nature of short-termism within democracy. Um, and I want to look at why short-termism is a problem for democracy. And if it's a problem for democracy, it's a problem, I, I will argue, for the realisation of the SDG agenda. And then I want, towards the end of the lecture, talk a little bit about some strategies for institutional reform. And I want to focus on two particular innovations that I see emerging, which I think are really interesting in this sphere. One is the independent offices for future generations. And the second is randomly selected mini-publics. And I'll explain what they are in a minute. And they're two very interesting emerging institutional forms at the moment. And I want to make an argument, actually, that there's a way of combining these, in, in, potentially, in, in very interesting ways. So why SDGs and democracy? First of all, democracy for many people are living, living on this planet is an aspirational ideal, whether or not they live, in a, they live in a democracy or not. And for those of us who live in democracies, democracy remains an aspirational idea and we'd like to see our democracies be democracies or be, or be more democratic. So democracy remains this ideal that, that, is, that is not something that is, it belongs to the, the, the established uh, industrial democracies, but is something which is, which is aspirational around the world. Secondly, SDGs are, uni are, are universal, so will apply to democracies as much as they apply to non-democracies, apply to highly industrialised nations as much as they um, apply to, to less, develop, le less industrially developed na nations, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were very much focused on on those areas, on the, on the less, in, uh, the, the least uh, economically developed nations. Finally, I think one of the areas that's really under discussed within the SDGs is SDG 16. And SDG 16 is suggestive that uh, democratic organisation is important, both as an end in itself, democracy is important, a la democracy, but secondly, that it's necessary for the realisation of the other SDGs. And I've quoted the, the SDG there, but most important, I think, uh, it, just to clarify this, is 16.6 and 16.7, where you can see that the writers of this in, in excellent UN speak have tried to use every word they can without using the word democracy. Uh, so every, it, we're talking about accountable, transparent, responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative institutions and decision making. So I want to make the argument that, that embedded within SDGs is this idea of, some, uh, of democratic forms of organisation. The challenge, though, I want to suggest, if, if we are interested in, in democratic organisation, is short-termism. And I want to ask the question about whether short-termism is actually hard-baked into democracy. That there's something about democracy that means it will not be able to deal effectively with the kind of challenges that SDG puts forward. So I want to make an argument, or the, or the argument is made, that, that this is a structural characteristic of democracies that means that we, we can't achieve sustainability. Um, and I want to rate, I want to argue that Actually, that's a characteristic of actually existing democratic institutions, but I don't think it's necessarily a characteristic of democracy per se. And I think there are certain institutional solutions, ways of thinking about restructuring democracies, which can help ameliorate short-termism. I also want to... I use the word here, I didn't use it, harmful short-termism. Being short-term is not always harmful, but in relation to SDGs, it often is. Now, the reason I say this is because there are eminent people out there who believe that democracies actually can't deal with these kinds of with the kind of SDG challenges we're facing. So, Martin Rees, who should be, who, who is a, um, a very significant scientist uh, within the UK uh, globally, actually, he was the astronomer, he was astronomer royal and former president of the Royal Society, and he's a member of the House of Lords. He says only an enlightened despot could push through the measures needed to navigate the 21st century safely. 
And James Lovelock famously, when talking about climate change, said that it might be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while. So there is a real need. These are people who are you know, significant figures within, our, within public discourse who are making the suggestion that actually democracy needs to be, you know, the democracy can't do the work we need it to. And for both of these pe people, part of their critique is this kind of short-termism inherent within democracy. And yeah, they're right that actually existing democracies have a problem. I've just put a couple of um, examples up here just to give us a, a bit of flavour. The Stern report is quite a famous report about um, the economic costs of climate change and showed categorically, I think, that from an economic perspective, that the benefits of strong mitigation outweigh the costs. And this was accepted by most governments, and as the report was accepted, and yet had almost no effect on climate change policy. So we kind of know that we can save ourselves a lot of trouble in the future if we do something, and yet we don't. The second one is a neat study that was done in the United States where Healy and Malhotra um, looked at the few, what happened to politicians who actually had prepared for natural disasters and invested in natural disasters compared to those politicians who responded to natural disasters. And it was those who responded visually to natural disasters but hadn't prepared who actually got re-elected and those who had spent public money to stop those, those disasters happening didn't get re-elected. Yeah. Uh, so again, the short-term, immediate, visual, visual politics outscores the being prepared. And I think we could, I've used this on climate change and natural disaster policy, I think we could be looking at any of these areas like biotech, the sort of existential risks, if we're looking at pensions in areas of social policy, or if we're looking at infrastructure development, that actually crisis management wins out over kind of long-term thinking. I'm just going to cover a number, number of reasons why there might be this kind of short-termism within democracy. And I think one of the most obvious is that those people who aren't here yet haven't got a voice in politics. One of the things that we know from the history of democracy is if your voice isn't being heard, your interests aren't, re aren't, 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 aren't responded to effectively. This was and continues to be the call of the feminist movement, of course, and politics of presence amongst feminist scholars arguing that if women aren't in, in places like parliament, then, there are, then their interests aren't being represented effectively. But I think future generations are the example of a group whose, whose voice just simply isn't and can't be heard. There is a structural issue here within, within democracy that, that future generations can't be present. But beyond that, there are a bunch of other reasons that people... I'm just going to go through this quickly. I could, we could have spent the whole lecture on this, but I just think it's worth, it's worth bringing these sorts of arguments out. So some writers talk about the kind of psychological issues that we have these very strong positive time preferences. This sort of preference for um, uh, utility in the here and now rather than in the distant future. And a lot of um, psychological writers have started to talk about the difference between fast thinking and slow thinking, that much of our thinking we do without reflecting and the heuristics we use tend to be heuristics which, um, which uh, incentivize, short, which, which kind of drive short-term activity action. So one, one example being um, negativity bias, where when we see uncertainty, we tend to see the problems rather than the rather than the uh, rather than the uh, positive poss possibilities. It's a sort of trait that we have as human beings. So they'll often focus on that as a reason why politics is short term. Interestingly, um, the work by people like Alan Jacobs and Scott Scott Matthews suggests that actually, when they test it, it doesn't see that explains individual actions, but doesn't necessarily explain attitudes towards politics as well as an understanding of uncertainty. And they argue that the causal complexity of long-term problems, i.e. the fact that these chains of causation, if we do this, I mean, climate change is the perfect example. What precisely are we going to do and what effects is it going to have? It's, cause, it's causally complex. And the more complexity there is, the more people have negativity towards policy, policies because they're not quite sure about what's going to happen. A, a second association with that is that there's a credibility problem. If we start trying to deal with long-term problems now, is it are we sure that the next set of political leaders are going to bother doing that as well? 
So there's a kind of sense in which if we try and set up long-term politics, uh, long-term projects, are we sure that the people, who, the people who we elect next or the people who follow are going to, are going to buy into that as well? A, set, a third set of problems around our electoral system. We all know that as soon as, you know, within a year or two of being elected, politicians are already thinking about the next election. It's argued in the United States that the day you, the day you uh, are sworn in is the day you start your next campaign. So you are looking for short-term wins. Long-term projects don't sell well to the to electorate because they can't see the outcomes of them. It's argued that vested interests tend towards the short term. So particular economic interests that, are embedded, that have embedded interests, we're thinking here, for example, like fossil fuel companies, etc., have an interest in keeping the status quo. Uh, interestingly, one of the entrenched interests it suggested are older generations who... Um, I mean, who, are, who tend to vote more and therefore politicians respond to their, their interests rather than the long-term interests of young people. For example, that's an, an argument that's often made. We find the problem in terms of competing policy si silos, where silos are, where policy areas, people are trying to compete for their particular area of policy without trying to, without recognising strategic gains. I think this happens within government and it happens within civil society as well, competing for your particular policy area. And of course, there are various dynamics of capitalism, some of which I've put up there. The fact that within contemporary capitalism, it's short-term financial cycles that people are being judged on. It's the return your company generated in the last three months or the last six months. A year is, a year is long-term planning for many, for, for many um, financial markets. We're seeing acceleration of consumption through capitalist dynamics. And it's argued by some we have this kind of discursive dominance of neoliberalism, which suggests that um, public sector action, bad, markets good. Again, markets being dominated by a short-term logic. And also a kind of techno-optimism, a sense if we leave things to the market, things will get sorted out, problems will get sorted. So there's a whole series of reasons, and you probably can locate yourself somewhere on that. But I just wanted to say that, you know, there's some which are from the sort of psychological angle right the way through to kind of structure of the political system through to the structure of the economy, all giving us different accounts of why this is a problem. Uh, now I've depressed you all, and um, yeah, I push, perhaps I should stop there and we should all go home. No. I want to, uh, in the face of that, I want to suggest that there are things that democracies can do in order to ameliorate that short-termism. I think one of the problems is that a lot of the work that's been going on in here tends to still focus on the, on the established institutions of, of constitutional liberal democracies. So we have a lot of work from... Um, Legal, philosopher, legal scholars and philosophers saying we just need to get the constitution right. We need to get principles and substantive clauses and participatory clauses. You know, they, some of you will come across the Our House Convention, which talked about the engagement of citizens, the, the right of citizens to engage in environmental decision making. That's along the similar kinds of lines. And we should look to constitutional courts to protect us. One of the problems is there are quite a few constitutions, especially new constitutions, that do protect future generations and do protect protect nature but it's at a highly aspirational aspirational level and so you, you can get a lot get away with quite a lot within this kind of the principles are established but the actual it has very little effect on actual practice I have I have some reservations about how far we can go along that line the second is um, legislatures, changes to our legislatures and certainly in places like Finland we've seen a committee for the future which is quite a influential committee. Most, most people who have been Prime Minister in Finland have been on this committee. They do a lot of long-term work. And many people would argue that Finland is one of those countries where they do take the long term much more seriously than in other democracies. I've been involved in a campaign with the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development, the House of Lords. This sounds very, very technical, but I think it's interesting. The, uh, the House of Lords is going through a review of its committees at the moment, um, and we and other people have suggested that there should be a committee for the future in the House of Lords, because the House of Lords aren't, don't have the problem of the kind of electoral cycle, and if the House of Lords is good at anything, and it might not be good at anything at all, but if it is good at anything, surely taking a long-term long perspective is one of the rationales for it, and one of the things it can do better than the, than the House of Commons, potentially. So there's a lot of debate here about whether or not we can create 
uh, a strong committee structure that actually deals with long-term issues. Um, controversially, people have talked about 15-year terms as a way of getting um, a way of sorting out the problem of the electoral cycle. Not many people I know like the idea of putting people politicians in for 15 years, but it's, it's an argument that's been put there. Controversially, uh, arguments about reducing the electoral power of older generations. As I approach that age, I, at the age that they're suggesting, I'm beginning to think that isn't, that isn't such a good idea. When I was younger, I thought it was a much better idea. Um, but the argument here being that our democracies are becoming particularly the older established democracies are becoming skewed towards older generations. People are living longer. So, and they vote more. People, so previously, when people, the, 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 our life expectancy was in the 60s and 70s, this wasn't a problem. But now life expectancy is 80 and 90, then that becomes a very solid block which the government tends to respond to. In this country, at the time when young people, the services for young people are being withdrawn and the kind of, kind of troubles that young people are having in terms of housing, in terms of tuition fees, etc., there's a triple lock on pensions. Pensioners are, are, are getting more than they were getting in, in previous generations. And yet young people are suffering, and that's partly because the government knows that these older, uh, these, uh, you know, this is a group of people that they're going to, that they're going to respond to. So we recently saw da David Runciman suggesting we should lower the voting age to six. <laughs> Have a, th have a think about, uh, have, a, have a go to, go to uh, Google it, because it's kind of an interesting argument. He, he says if, if politicians had to go into schools, that would change political discourse. That was interesting. Uh, you know, and, and then when you look at what six-year-olds and eight-year-olds and ten-year-olds' ambitions for the world look like, actually, yeah, from an SDG perspective, that's not such a bad thing. He says it was a thought experiment. He's beginning to think actually he might run a campaign on it now. But uh, you know, he's, he, the point being, though, and it's an important point about the demographic shift within democracies itself causing some problems, and therefore the legislature having to respond to that. We've seen arguments for guaranteed representatives of future generations, and also for the creation of sub-majority rules, i.e., when there's a significant minority of people, uh, politicians of, of our members of parliament who are. Um, concerned about the long-term impact of a particular policy that they would be able to delay it or they would be able to there would be some mechanism in place i think all of these things are fine um, and i think we should try and do work with our legislature but i think there is something about legis legis legislatures that means that they have this particularly uh, electoral electoral bodies uh, which have a, a, a a problem with short-termism just by the nature of their characters so I think these are kind of ameliorating factors but I also think about we have to think about the institutional ecology that surrounds those those bodies as well and that's what I want to do talk about for the rest of this lecture is thinking outside the box of the Constitution and the legislature and I'm kind of interested, I've got interested, which is strange for Democrats. Democrats tend to get very worried about independent bodies because um, they're non-electoral I've started getting very interested in them. And there's a French um, political philosopher called Rosan Vallon, and he says, democracy can flourish only if it acknowledges the risks of dysfunctionality and equips itself with institutions capable of subjecting its own inner workings to constructive evaluation. He doesn't talk about short-termism, but I think that you can apply his argument that there, there is a recognised dysfunctionality within democracy, which is short-termism, and mm -hmm. democracies would do well to create institutions that, in recognition of that, that provide oversight, that monitor, that regulate in some ways, which have some sort of independent or some sort of political power in order to try and ameliorate that short-termism and, and sort of promote long-term interests. I think an example of this that some of you might be aware of is the UK Climate, Climate Change Committee. It has a legislative basis, it um, has annual emission reduction budgets, um, it, it holds the government to account, but this is only actually relevant to one aspect of one SDG. It's not even the whole SDG in relation to climate change in terms of emissions. You, I can't imagine universalizing this across all of the SDGs. This would just look too, this would be just too, diffi too difficult to imagine. But it's the kind of thing that one might think of. And I think it's an, inter it's an interesting example. But what I want to look at is, a, is this emerging body of institutions. Um, and I'm going to give you a hint, but I don't think it, does anybody know who that is? Anybody? That's interesting. Her name is Sophie Howe. 
Actually, I'm going to skip two slides. She lives here in Wales. And she is the Commissioner for Future Generations in Wales. She runs a body called the... She is the, there is a commission, an office that focuses on the interests of future generations. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail at the moment. But I'm interested how... I show this slide a lot in... You know, a lot of my lectures in, uh, are in London, and, um, and I say that this is the, this is the only future generation organ to people interested in sustainability, and they don't know who she is either. There is a real problem about London, London centrism um, and English centrism. So there have been three independent offices for future generations. Unfortunately, or for, they haven't had a great history um, in the sense of the, the, the length of time. Um, and I can talk about why that might be, and I also want to talk about how you might strengthen them. But I think they're a really interesting idea. There is a, they're part of a broader group of institutions, independent institutions, who might promote sustainable development or children's, uh, or children's interests. And they, they get together, they're called a net, uh, there's an international network now of, of institutions for future generations. But these are the only three that specifically have future generations in their title and mandate, that specific question. So the first one was, was established in um, Israel, um, and that uh, commissioner had the right to information. He could ask for information from um, different departments and parliamentary committees. He had the right to examine parliamentary bills, and he had the right to have reasonable time to prepare his opinion on these bills, which basically meant he had the right of delay if he was able to... And what he, what he was able to do was to occasionally stop the Knesset from putting, something, uh, putting a bill forward on the grounds that had they considered future generations. And that moment was able to, in, in a couple of instances, stop certain parts, pieces of legislation. He, that position was abolished in 2006, and, I, and I'll explain why in a second. The second one is the Hungarian Parliamentary Commissioner for Future Generations, which um, existed for uh, four years, uh, Sandor Fulop, and, uh, and uh, now it's a deputy ombudsman. Uh, and that in the fundamental law, in the constitution of Hungary, they've got a right to the protection of future generations and non-human nature. And he had the power to suspend administrative action in certain areas if need be, but he acted mostly as an ombudsman. Um, interestingly, and I'll just do a side, I won't mention this, I'll just mention this one now. Um, with the right-wing government, the right-wing government uh, that was established in Hungary, they had a bonfire of independent agencies. And everyone expected any oversight agency was removed um, in the name of popular sovereignty. Um, and uh, this one survived as it became a deputy ombudsman. And one of the reasons it survived is because the populist leader in Hungary said, ah, oh, future generations, yes, that's good, future generations of Hungarians. So he, he, he was reinterpreting this in a, very, in, in a very nationalist way, but actually allowed the survival of the office. Um, and that it, it leaves some interesting political space, even in that sort of difficult situation. And the one that I want to focus most time on is the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, which is, which is Sophie, you all know Sophie now. Um, and there they are, her role is to promote the well-being goals which i'll explain in a second and to monitor the action of all public bodies and public service boards who have to report to her on a regular basis and then produce a future generations report one year before the election for the welsh government the argument here being that it's an input into the electoral into the in just just at the point when when they're starting to put their manifestos together and the argument is that if there's something out there and public about future generations generations that this may actually affect the manifestos of the political party. We don't know whether it will yet because we haven't seen, it hasn't survived, uh, we haven't gone through an electoral cycle yet. So just as I say, this is Wales. You are here, Wales is there. And um, Wales is, a, um, is one of the devolved nations of the, one of the devolved, has devolved responsibilities, hasn't got as much power as Scotland, um, but has its own government and has certain rights over, has certain um, uh, legislative uh, rights of, um, and one of the interesting things is when Wales and Scotland were established, the Wales Act and the Scotland Act included sustainable development as a principle for governance in those two devolved nations. So in, in UK and in England, we have no we have no legislative basis for sustainable development, but in Wales and, Northern, uh, Wales and Scotland they actually do, which I think is very interesting and has allowed them to do quite innovative things.
So they created, the Welsh Government created in 2015 the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and the role of the Commissioner is to oversee the implementation and the realisation of that Act. And what they did is a big national conversation called The Wales We Want in the run-up to this Act. Uh, and they re-articulated basically the SDGs within these kind of broad goals of a globally responsible Wales, a prosperous Wales. They, they felt that the SDG language was too technical. Um, so they went out and engaged with uh, different community groups and came up with this way of organising the SDGs in relation to these wellbeing goals. And then generated five ways through their discussions, through consideration, five ways of working towards these goals, which I think are very interesting. One is taking the long term, very interesting. Prevention, integration across silos, collaboration across sectors, and interestingly, Equal, sta equal status, public involvement. So they were born through a process of public involvement, although you know, there are reasonable critiques about how good that public conversation was. But it, the, the act and the agency itself were creatures of the, you know, emerged from this participatory process and themselves promote the idea of participation within their own work and within their own and within the work of other public sector bodies and there is a legal duty now on all public bodies this is out taken out of the um, out bit, bit of the act um, where there is a requirement for public bodies to carry out sustainable development using these goals and these ways of working and it's the role of the um, commissioner to, to ensure that that to ensure that that happens she has the right to when when she gets the annual reports from the public bodies, if she feels they're not working, if they're not doing enough work, she's got the right to go back to them and say, I'm sorry, this isn't good enough, you've now got to come back with another plan. And that, we haven't seen that standoff yet, and that's going to be interesting when we, do, when we do see a standoff, I'm sure. That's actually when we learn whether these things are powerful or not. But at the moment, we're still, we're still waiting. <coughs> There are, from a democratic perspective, though, concerns about the role of these sorts of independent agencies, um, and particularly an independent agency that, that claims to represent future generations or represent the long term. The first, I think, is quite easy to deal with. You know, these unelected bodies, what right do they have to, to, make, to, to make hay in the political system? I think they've got all sorts of rights because they, they, they're a creature of statute. They've been created by Parliament. Uh, in order to do a particular, play a particular role that Parliament sees as important and could be abolished by Parliament. That's exactly what happened with the Knesset. Uh, just to tell the story, a little bit of the story there, the um, particular commissioner became quite unpopular with certain part of the Knesset, in particular the, the, more, um, the uh, more traditional Jewish community who felt that he was representing future generations in a much too sort of uh, liberal way. And they also asked, who is this person who has this right to uh, tell us about future generations? And he kept saying, well, you created my body in order that I would. And they, they abolished him because he got in the way of them doing what they wanted to do. So they, they, it's that sort of irony there of um, they abolished the long-term commissioner because they wanted to do more short-term stuff. But that's, a, you know, that's another issue. But I think I want to just hold that idea that a particular community within Israel didn't think that he was speaking for them. And I think that's a really critical thing for us to, to, to come back to in a second. That relates to their political vulnerability. These bodies are going to challenge the core policies, projects and rationales of existing political elites. And one of the problems they have is when, that, um, con when the commissioner in Israel was abolished, there wasn't a constituency who put up a fuss to support him. Who is the constituency for future generations? Most civil society organisations are actually interested in their particular issue. Climate change, biodiversity, health, social welfare, whatever, whatever the particular thing is. Even though they've got long-term aspects to them, they've got their own policy community they engage with. And this, the problem that, that this particular commissioner had was that there was no sort of support within civil society because they, they, they didn't see him as their voice particularly. I think that's a really interesting problem. It's that problem we, you know, who... who Rep, rep, sorry, uh, future generations there aren't there to represent themselves and they're not there to support the institutions that are trying to speak on their behalf. Finally, there's the question about how precisely do you represent future generations? Of course, by the 
by the nature of non-existence, this is always going to be a surrogate form of representation. I think one of the problems about the existing commissioners and the problem that happened in Israel and to a certain extent in Hungary as well, and the, the problem that Sophie might have is, who are you to speak for future generations? And a lot of people pointing out, okay, it's another member of the, you know, someone else in the political elite who's talking to the political elite about, about the needs of future generations. I think what this misses, I think one of the, one of the things that it misses is that there are, or one of the things that's difficult here is that there are, we have to recognise that there are a plurality of interests across generations. The interests of the near future are going to be different from the interests of the long-term future. Within those generations, there's going to, people tend to talk about generations as, an, as, an, as a single body. Well, no, within those bodies, there are going to be inequalities and differentiations. So there's going to be differences across generations and within generations. How does one person try to capture that? How does one person, usually a, a very well-educated um, somebody who's, who's been involved in, in uh, political or uh, elites, represent that diversity. And I think that's something, as I say, that's something that the, certainly the uh, first commissioner in, in, in Israel had problems with. One of the answers to this I want to suggest is, is what the Welsh Commission is starting to do and starting to recognise and is within the legislation that actually public involvement and participation in the work of the commissioner is absolutely critical for that commissioner to really be able to represent, you're never going to represent perfectly, to better represent that plurality of interests across and within generations. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a second. So what did OFG, what have these offices for future generations done in terms of participation? The Israeli commissioner, he had no explicit public participation. If you read his, one of his books, he talks about public participation, but actually he's talking about political communication. He's talking about letting the public know what he's done. That is not public participation. I don't need to tell IDS that. I think we're agreed that is not public participation. The Hungarian commissioner was an ombudsman and actually said, you know, I don't think I can know what the interests of future generations will be, but I will represent the cases of people who can show that the interests of future generations um, are, being, are being misused. So he was led by complaints from the public. But again, he recognised that was complaints from the articulate public. That was complaints coming from leading civil society organisations. But, you know, that's an interesting, you know, but there are plenty of ombudsmen that have become very legitimate institutions within democracies by responding to complaints from the public and being recognised by the public as their voice within government. So that is, I think, an interesting way to go. The Welsh Commission, I already mentioned, there was a, there was a national conversation to establish it. There's a legislative basis with, for the Commission to actually be involved and promote greater engagement um, and actually citizen voice and active participation being absolutely fundamental to the well-being of future generations. There are two things going on here. One of them is a recognition that if we don't have an active functioning democracy now, we aren't going to have one in the future. So there's a kind of argument that we have to sustain our and build and regenerate and revitalise our existing democracy, otherwise we aren't going to hand on a democracy to the future. We can't imagine it's just going to be something that future generations do. We need to be doing it now. And actually acting politically and acting democratically now is actually fulfilling an obligation to future generations. I think that's an interesting perspective to have. And at the same time, they also recognise that hearing more voices about future generations is absolutely critical. And one of the arguments I have been making recently is I think we think about we think about future generations very much from our own social perspectives. And I think we imagine, our imaginary of future generations is very much from our own imaginary now. So us as a group of, an, an, you know, group of people who are academically trained, who are in certain types of networks, we have particular visions of what we would like to, uh, future generations to do and to be. I, I would argue that a different social community somewhere else will have different perspectives on that and the different perspectives on what is needed to, do, to achieve, uh, the, to, to realise the interests of future generations. And I would argue to realise the interests, to realise SDGs as well. And I think it's that multiplicity of voices is absolutely critical. And I, and, um, I think what the Welsh Commission has stumbled on, I don't, I don't mean that rudely, I don't mean that accidentally, but they, I think what they've recognised is this independent body alone is not going to do its work unless it can be seen to be to speak 
from the different communities of Wales and in response to those different communities. And I think this is a really interesting moment in Wales. So this becomes part of an argument about democratising democracy for the long term. A lot of, a lot of people like Lord Rees and um, Lovelock are concerned that democracy is the problem. I want to argue that actually part of the problem is we're not doing enough democracy. It's the kind of democracy we're doing that is actually part of the short, which is um, the problem with short termism. And offices for future generations are one part, from my mind, and only one part. I'm not offering this as a panacea. I just think they're one part of the institutional ecology. And I think another part of it is to try and start thinking about how we can do participation in a way that enables us to think long term. Now partly that's quite difficult because a lot of participatory initiatives are by their nature quite short term. For example participatory budgeting, how do we distribute this budget this year? How do we, how do we deal with this particular problem now? There are ways of making, and, and certain participatory budgets achieve this, there are ways of participatory budgeting to, to be long term, that, that's, that's, that's true, but many of the participatory processes we deal with don't necessarily have the motivational and incentive structures to orientate participants towards the long term. I think there's one institutional design that I'm very interested in and, and is, very, is, is gaining in, in uh, reputation at the moment. Um, is this use of what are often referred to technically as deliberative mini-publics, but often citizens' juries, consensus conferences, citizens' assemblies, those sorts of things. And if, if the, if the um, Commissioner of Wales and other public bodies are interested in getting citizens involved in strategic level decision-making, then I think we have to be very careful about how we design, and we have to think very carefully about how we design those institutions. And I want to suggest that these institutions that combine random selection with facilitated deliberation have some very interesting characteristics for long-term thinking. I'm not going to go through this and people can have slides afterwards, but there's a whole series of technologies here under that banner of, um, of um, random se randomly selected mini-publics. All the way from citizens' juries, which may only involve 12 people, to G1000s, which can involve 1,000 people. And they, have, they run for different lengths of time. The most famous one at the moment, and I'll talk about it in a minute, is the Citizens' Assembly that was held in Ireland. Um, and there are particular reasons to look at that in, in some detail in a second. But what I want to suggest to you is I'm not just making this up. There are a whole series of practitioners and practices out there that are using this. And one of the things I want to point to in a second is that the evidence from them is that citizens, when participating in this, do take a long-term perspective. And I want to talk about why that's the case. There's something about random selection and facilitated deliberation that orientates participants one of the reasons is the plurality issue. By randomly selecting people, you randomly select in a whole host of social perspectives that you don't get if, you, if processes are open to rule and it's, the, it's the, um, those people who are already politi more politically active who engage. Secondly, it has a cognitive effect, which is Typically, I mean, a citizens' assembly can last a number of weekends, and part of that is a process of learning, and then part of that is a process of deliberation before coming to a recommendation. You are, I was going to say manipulating, you can say manipulating actually, and manipulating, and we can use the word manipulating in a positive sense, by the way, I know it's, it has negative connotations, but you are creating the context and the conditions within which people reflect, that they can move from this kind of type one immediate reactionary thinking to a more reflective, deliberative perspective. Um, that's the kind of psychology talk in political science, in political theory and political science talk, we see people starting to take on a common good orientation. And that leads to kind of ideas of considered judgment or collective intelligence. And the, the, what's fascinating about these, um, these bodies is that very often they come up with arguments and ideas that politicians haven't necessarily put forward themselves. But politicians, can, uh, but those observing them can see actually these are completely reasonable uh, ideas and recommendations. They just come from a different place. They come from a place of plurality rather than from a particular political platform or standpoint. The other reason I'm very interested in random selection is the reason the Greeks were interested in it. The Greeks didn't have no conception of deliberation or um, of, of the kind of deliberative democracy. They were trying to protect themselves from, from wealthy oligarchs. 
They were trying to protect the polity from wealthy families. And the way they did that was assign positions of political authority through sortition. I actually think that's kind of interesting. Sortition can be a way of defending, this, of defending institutions against asymmetries of social and economic power. I offer that as a probably, probably quite a con uh, potentially controversial um, in, uh, perspective, but I think it's very interesting that actually sortition, its historical use, has been to try and deal with, um, deal with those kind of asymmetries. And thirdly, I think the important thing for offices of future generations is that many publics are trusted by the public. When these things have, have taken place and the public know about them, then they tend to trust them. They tend to trust them for two reasons. It's either kind of a more populist argument of they're, they're people like me, this isn't the political elite, or they're kind of other arguments around these people have spent a long time thinking about this thing. That's very interesting. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to say too much about this, but plenty of evidence that on long-term issues, science-wise, dealing with long-term controversial issues, same with the uh, long-term scientific and technological issues, same with the Danish board, the Citizens' Assembly on, in Ireland, famous now for its, uh, you know, helping to change the law on abortion, in, uh, the constitutional status of abortion, also spent four weeks dealing with climate change, which is currently being dealt with within the Parliament. Jefferson Centre in the United States dealing with rural issues and climate change. And these other organisations have all run mini-publics very successfully, and some of them with significant effect on areas of long-term thinking. And bizarrely, I find this bizarre. I hope many of you will know about Extinction Rebellion, maybe one of the most exciting social movements that has emerged in the UK, arguing that we need to declare a climate emergency. Actually, my county council the other day, Wiltshire Council, Wiltshire Council, this is a rural Conservative council, declared a climate emergency last week. Amazing. I, that, that, I'd never thought I'd see the day. Um, and that was because of Extinction Rebellion activists. But they're ask, asking the government to... <coughs> argue for a climate, you know, to, to establish a climate emergency. What is their institutional response? What should the government do? It should hold a citizens' assembly. It should hold a randomly selected... What are these radical activists doing, arguing for a citizens' assembly? But it's the same kind of argument I've just been offering, that this would be not the political elite, that it is ordinary people being involved in politics. But actually, they bring a different perspective to politics. So I just wanted to just make it clear that this isn't just an idea that's in the academic ether, that it's people like me talking about it and my friends. There's, there's organisations out there who are delivering this. There are social movements out there arguing this as part of their platform. I find this fascinating. I've worked on this stuff for 20 years. Not, for the first 19 years, no one was interested. And now suddenly everyone's interested. I'm very happy about that. And I, I'm not sure how long it will last, but it's very interesting. Two more slides. So our tendency when we're thinking about dealing with harmful short-termism is to try and do a little fix, a techno fix of our traditional elite institutions, to try and you know, rejig the constitution or reorientate the legislature. I actually think we've got to be much more creative. And I think independent office is a really interesting idea. I think um, randomly selected assemblies are interesting ideas. I actually think they could be connected in interesting ways in order to give that office more legitimacy. When that Office of Future Generations makes its report that is unpopular amongst politicians, if it can show a link to the public through many publics, then I think, actually, it will have more political capital and political force. Uh, take us back to SDG 16, which says we need to develop effective, accountable and transparent institutions, and we need to ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory decision-making at all levels. I want to argue, you know, perhaps controversially, and it's the last, you know, I can say this right at the end of my lecture, that we need this as much as any other nation within established established liberal democracies. And the kinds of institutions that I've been talking about are the kinds of institutions that can start to do that work. I am not, and I want to stress, I am not thinking that an office of future generations and a few mini publics are going to change the world. I just think it's the kind of institutional thinking that we have to do if we think that democracies are going to, un over are going to start to ameliorate harmful short-termism. I also think in those countries that are democratising that we shouldn't just focus on the legislature and the constitution. 
We should be spending just as much in time on these kind of independent bodies and on the institutions that are, and enable citizens to engage in strategic political decision making. And I think it's only then that we can really see, we might be able to achieve some of the SDGs, but in actually reorientating government towards the long term, I think it's this kind of institutional restructuring that is absolutely necessary. Thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you very much, Graham. Um, we're going to take a, open it up to take a few questions. I think it's, it's great for me to be hearing some things that we've talked about at IDS for a long time, about democratizing democracy, coming up with a new institutional ways to bring citizen voice in. People may not be as familiar with that list of experiments that you ran over. And the way I oftentimes explain it, I don't know whether, whether you use this, is in the law, we give huge power to something called the jury. And we take 12 randomly you know, chosen people who are given the power of life and death over others. And so it's that basic idea that well, let's take a jury of citizens who have the power to actually think about the future of the planet that I think is, is a really strong, strong analogy. And in some parts of the world, as you said very quickly, um, governments have actually given their power to these juries. They've said, whatever you come up with, we will abide by. And that's led to some very different kinds of decisions. So it's a very exciting and in-depth idea. And I think I'm right to say that there's been a whole movement also around Brexit to say, let's leave it to a citizens. Yeah, I was one of the signatories of the Guardian letter, actually. <laughs> citizens Assembly. So let's open it up to questions. We'll take two or three at a time and ask Graham to respond and then, then keep going. Maybe for Graham, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Maybe say where you're from and then the question. So I'll start right here. We've got a roaming mic. And then I'll go to the back. So, very nice to meet you. Thank you for Thank the you. for the presentation. What's your name? I'm Julia. I'm uh, doing a PhD here in a program called Pastures, which uh, uh, is about pastoralism, uncertainty, and resilience. Uh, so I also like think a lot about uncertainties and uh, a lot about you know different ways we dealing uh, with uncertainties. Uh, my background is in uh, civil society and I was working for uh, an organization that's called International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, which is an alliance of different uh, sectors of civil society that facilitates their participation into the FAO political processes. So very much about uh, participation of civil society and like also about uh, different interests and stuff. I will be a bit shorter. <laughs> he's he's, uh, he's yes. very good. He's, he's good. Exactly. So no, I I think it's really interesting that you talk about uh, short termism, and it's very useful in some senses to 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 ask certain questions. But um, I was thinking, like, is that really the main problem of why democracy? <laughs> isn't working like for sure there is there are some problems related with short termism and, and many many problems but um, you know like the power struggles and the different interests and the economic interests are definitely you know for me so central in the sense that even if you have a long-term government of 15 years like who will ensure that this long-term government doesn't, okay? So that's, that's the thing, and, and, and also with, I was interested to know why you're focusing on future generations, while like even today, here and now, we have like so many voices that are not represented. So this idea of like uh, the future generation and the, 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 the ideal, you know, leaving the planet in a certain way, et cetera, like, who decides, you know, what, what is the future generation, what is yep. the kind of future that we want for them, etc. Like, these are very complex yep. uh, issues. Okay, great. And Two questions. Let's yes. get open up for some more. So, great questions about why short tourism of all the problems democracy yeah. faces, and what about the people who don't have voice today? A couple of hands in the back, so let's go and, again, keep your comments and questions fairly brief so that we can get as many in as possible. 
Hi, uh, my name's Alex. I work for uh, ITAD, a global development consultancy um, in Brighton. Um, Welcome. I was just wondering, uh, so you, you did mention uh, it briefly and you referred to sort of a lot of obstacles in the way for successful citizen participation, things like uh, capitalism and the way it's organised. Um, I mean, how do you think that citizen engagement can directly um, sort of act as a counterweight against the sorts of economic influences that we do see sort of everywhere? Because um, it seems to me that even though we have organisations like the Citizens' Assembly, their, the, their apparent influence is quite negligible in comparison to a lot of the other um, more hierarchical. Um, yeah. yeah. Cheers. So did you hear that? Yep. Yeah. Was another right in front of you? Oh. Hi, thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, my name is Vibhor. I'm doing a master's in governance, development, and public policy. So what was your name again? Sorry, Vibhor. Yeah. Uh, I come from Delhi, where the government of the state has tried to do citizen assemblies quite often and at quite a large scale, uh, to a great degree with, uh, with different degrees of success. But the one consistent challenge that they reported and was found was just information asymmetry, not just making deliberation inadequate, but also reducing the ability for that deliberation to be long-termist in the absence of sufficient information. So how do you think that's a challenge, given that that's a challenge that plagues both democracies and citizen juries? can be challenged at scale, assuming there's something we want to do everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So three, let's, let's go to those three okay. great questions about why short-termism of all the issues we could face in democracy. Uh, can citizens, put, translated very briefly from what I heard, can citizens' assemblies really challenge the power of things like capitalism? <laughs> um, and, and what about information asymmetries uh, in these deliberations? Okay, so I, I, wa I want to... Um, I want to say that actually most of the assemblies that I were talking about, oops, sorry. Most of these assemblies to date have been creatures of government, i.e. been established by government. And there's a, there's, a, there's a positive and a downside of that. The positive side is they often then, when, when organized well and related to the decision-making structure, they can have, they can have effect. And a lot of, I've run a couple of citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, which have been independent. The first one on Brexit, actually, in 2017. How many of you knew there was a Brexit assembly? That's how, it, how interested the, uh, the, the, the um, politicians and the, and the media were. And I think that does limit the kinds of agendas that they've been set on. So one of the reasons I've got quite interested in independent agencies is because I actually think they can create they can create, to a certain degree, independent centres of power. Okay, so I think that, I mean, if we think about the way that the, um, you know, financial decision making is made in this country, and I agree, you know, I'm, here I'm not engaging in a critique of capitalism, but it's independent agencies who are setting a lot of the, the um, boundaries within which governments act. And I think that my interest here is how can, part of my interest here, and I could have, I could have expressed it more in these more radical terms, is how do you build alternative centres of power within, within the state? So I'm, I, I recognise the need for, you know, that civil society creates them without the state, but can you create them within the state? I do actually see independent agencies as creating that, have, of having that opportunity. Their effectiveness is very often associated with the, with the power of the constituency that sits behind them. And I think one of the problems, as I've articulated already, is these offices don't have that constituency naturally. So I think they actually have to create it within the public. And that's why I think that these sorts of things like citizens' assemblies would do two things for offices for future generations. One which responds to your second point. One is you would hear a diversity of voices, which, the, which would then help create the agenda of the office for the future generations. So I think that's really important. There's that kind of diversity issue. Um, and the, the second is, it begins to build the political capital of that independent agency. Because at the moment, it's too easy just to abolish it if the politicians don't like it. Whereas if you start to build an institution which relies in its functioning on public support, it has a different, it starts to create an, uh, an independent power. I'm not, no, you know, I'm not suggesting that in the next five years she's going to, uh, you know, um, that... Uh, um, Sophie is going to overthrow capitalism. I really don't think that's going to happen. But she's starting to have an independent voice which, isn't, which doesn't have the same degree of 
because it's independent and because she's using public engagement strategies and she, she needs to, you know, she needs to, for my view, in, intensify that, she's able to create a position for herself to argue for these things which are counter-economic, at times are counter-economic interests. So I am interested in how do you build these centres of power within the state as much as without the state, okay? So that, that's part of my answer to your question. It's part of the answer to, to your question. But also you asked me, why am I looking at short-termism as given, basically given capitalist dynamics, etc. I think short-termism gives us a really interesting lens with which to cut. So if, if we believe that one of the problems with democracy is that they don't deal well with the long term, we should try and understand what the drivers of that short-termism is, recognising that not all of them will be drivers that are capitalist in nature. And that actually we might be able to, uh, we, that, that, that some of them are being driven to do with our own psychologies, re, independent of, of, of economic structures. And that we can start to design institutions that take that seriously. Um, and part of that will be having a particular take on the nature of capitalism. I think it gives you a particular angle of thinking about it, and it allows you to recognise that there are other barriers that one could be working on, which aren't just about established economic interests. I do think you've got a very important point about one of the dangers about arguing for future generations is you can forget the poor now. I recognise that, and I have no answer to that. I just, my question is, how do democracies become more long-term? I recognise that the danger of a, long, a democracy that takes a long-term seriously could be the neglect of actually existing peoples. My feeling is that if you are doing the kinds of strategies I'm talking about, then you're going to hear a diversity of, of perspectives and that's going to feed into the Future Generations Commission. That's why I'm interested in randomly selected bodies, because those people who don't normally get involved in participation are invited and you wait until you fulfil a quota you know, the point about these randomly selected bodies is you make sure that it's 50% women, 50% men. You ensure that the socially, that socially deprived people are in there as much as, you know, according to their position. So, so, that, so I, I admit your first, so I think it's important to recognise it. There is a danger of being orientated towards sustainability, long-term sustainability that can have the effect that you, you said. So, so I'm going to just accept that. Great. And the last issue was about information asymmetry. I think the things that the Indian government calls citizens' assemblies aren't what I call citizens' assemblies. Um, citizens' assemblies always have an education phase where people learn about the issue. So it's, and I think one of the problems is things called citizens' assemblies where people are brought together and ask what they think now are not much better than opinion polls, to be honest. And uh, the, the, the citizens' assembly in um, Ireland lasted 18 months. The Citizens' Assembly in British Columbia that dealt with electoral reform lasted 11 months, one weekend a month, of and the first quarter of that was education, for hearing from different perspectives. So. And one can imagine the difference that might have made in a Brexit process where people <laughs> learned, first of all, about the possible impacts and alternatives and then made a decision rather than making a decision and then learning the hard way. Yeah, so, so actually, just, just on that, there in, um, in, in Oregon, they started to inserting mini publics before referendum votes in order to give the public to say this is to look at the issues. And I think that's a really interesting development. So really interesting. This notion of deliberation to the process. Yeah. Okay, let's take another round of questions. And I think also if we, those of you online, if you want to send any questions in, Sarah can read them out. Um, we've got one here and one here. And then we'll Thank come you. up here. My name's Mike Tyler. I represent the older generation. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, also coming, I'm coming fast, Mike, I'm coming fast. <laughs> but I also represent a new initiative that's being launched that is, in effect, a bottom-up initiative called the Global Community Development Initiative. And my question is, um, after your interesting lecture, that would you agree that the global 17 global SDGs and their realisation by 2030 will best be achieved by bottom-up as opposed to top-down development? Can I just say, whenever someone, anyone says, would you agree, it's really difficult, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How about right here? Here? Yeah. 
Thank you for this interesting talk. Um, my name is Dina. I'm also working on my PhD here. And I have two connected but uh, somewhat separate questions. And one is related to the examples of the citizen juries that you were describing. Um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the outputs of what the citizen juries produce. So in a sense, we know a lot about these experiments. So the literature tells us about the existence of these experiments and the format that they adopt and what the experimentation looks like. But we know less about how much of it actually gets mainstreamed into policy. And so the question that is connected to that is, does it matter who's initiating it? So you mentioned that, that one of the objectives would be for um, public agencies, for instance, to have these types of samples from uh, uh, the views from the community members and so on. If it comes from a university or if it comes from a research group and it doesn't have, it has similar um, policy feedback, does it matter who's starting it? And if it doesn't matter who's starting it, therefore why does it have to be a product of democratic uh, system? So for instance, something that I, I can I use as a, as, a, as a parallel case and it's not, it's not described as a citizen jury but it functions very much the same way, is experiments like shadow parliaments, for instance, yeah. which can yeah. be in an authoritarian context. So this comes from a perspective of contestation. Mm -hmm. it's, not, uh, it's not meant as a direct route to speak to a policy invitation to, to yeah. uh, discuss a particular issue, but it might have the same impact. So I, I'm curious how we understand citizen juries in terms of, of this framing. Yeah. And connected to this, and this is the second part of the question, is what is the utility of using the framing of democracy. You started with um, the SDG saying that they strategically don't talk about democracy, but they talk about features of it. But a lot of what we heard today at the lecture were also about public policy experiments. And so public modalities of governance, so modalities of governance. So can we see those in systems that are not particularly democratic or systems that may mix features of democracy and autocracy? And I think that's it for me. <laughs> very large question, sorry. Thank, thank you very much. And, and Stephanie here, you had a question? Yeah. Well, my first question was actually a bit related to the one, so, that, so the online people can hear. Oh, sorry. That's good. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, I, I work a lot on finance and okay. blah, blah. Um, So, very interesting. Um, but my first question was a bit also related to the previous question. Uh, I felt a little bit nervous, I, I'm sure it wasn't your intention, that you characterize it as, as a problem of democracy, because then you could see it as, as saying, oh well, you know, a dictator who's around for 30 years running the country can have a longer term perspective. No, I wasn't, and, and I wasn't. that's not what you mean. <laughs> sure. but, but I mean, there is, it could be interpreted that way. It could but be. my main question was about, um, I have to confess I'm an economist, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how does this interact uh, with the sort of allocation of economic resources? In, in the case of governments, I think it's quite clear uh, that, that these bodies would make an input into influencing how governments allocate, say, the, the budget. But how would it interact with, say, um, the structure of the, the, the decisions that are made in the economy, say, by the financial sector or by the investors, uh, which are even more short-termist, yep. as you said, than, than the political system? So how would you change that? How would you then use these bodies to influence the decision-making, to make it actually sort of real? Great, thank you. So again, three three great oh, questions. Graham. Fantastic. You pick them up, and we'll try to get one more round through before yeah. we finish at half six. Very quickly, um, of course, I agree that bottom up is important. I, I'm I'm um, often a pariah in these kind of things of saying actually we still need to do work within and in the state. So I, I'm absolutely I've got absolutely supportive of bottom up change. I also th I think you have to uh, you have to work on both on both levels. So um, would you would I agree that bottom up is important? Absolutely. Um, Mainstreaming, who initiates, um, do they have an impact? So um, it's only recently that I think these things are having more strategic impact. So, so some of the smaller experiments, or some of the smaller ones run by Jefferson Center, Mass LPB, New, New Democracy, they will often only work with a decision maker when they know that they're going to take that recommendation seriously. And actually, there's a bunch of Polish activists now. Unfortunately, the guy who was recently murdered in Gdansk, the leader in Gdansk, he'd been using them, and he said that he would commit himself to whatever they recommended. He was, not, he was just going to take it. Um, 
And that's really interesting. The ones that have come out, the Citizens' Assembly, there was an agreement by government that whatever they came forward with on the issue of abortion within the Constitution would go to a referendum. That was a, a pure, another example. The British Columbia one with um, electoral reform did that, but it didn't get the threshold in the vote because they, they created a supermajority. So what we are starting to see, a lot of these have been experimental, but we are actually seeing them becoming embedded. And on the initiates one, here, breaking news for you, two weeks ago, the Parliament of East Belgium, which is the German-speaking area of East Germ of, of, of um, Belgium, decided to uh, have enacted a new citizens assembly initiative which says that there will be a certain number of citizens assemblies a year but the decision as to what they will be on and who they will be on will not be made by a parliament they will be made by a separate citizens council which is again a randomly selected group so they're doing agenda setting now interestingly importantly they're separating the agenda setting from the actual task but they've got a group or they will create a group of randomly selected citizens the government will make uh, will say we think we should deal with this civil society will be able to say we think we should deal with this but they're getting around that agenda setting problem that you're suggesting by creating another institution which then says these are the two priorities this year that's what we're going to hold citizens assemblies on and the parliament has agreed to to take those recommendations uh, i mean they haven't agreed to implement them uh, but they will become part of the policy process um, Interestingly, my, one of my colleagues is Chantal Mouffe at the Centre for Study of Democracy. So you can imagine when I got the job at, um, at CSD, she was worried that, oh dear, this history of contestation and of agonistic democracy was going to get overwhelmed by this deliberative, uh, experimental democracy person. And in fact, actually, I think we've got a lot in common because I think these, these bodies are and can and should be used as ways of contesting power and contesting the status quo. But the actual process of contesting is through deliberation within them. What comes out the other end is, you know, it's the, it's the agenda setting and the and what comes out at the end of them, which are which will contest power. But there needs to be this protected space for deliberation. So I think there's an interesting overlap here potentially between more contestational views of democracy and deliberation. I also think these are in many ways more democratic than our existing democratic practices, which is why I will happily frame this in relation to democracy, because I'm actually arguing that we need to democratise democracy. We shouldn't think that the existence of representative legislatures makes us a fully functioning democracy. It's about the institutions and practices that surround it. So that's part of my, so I'm happy and I'm unap unapologetic about the democracy framing. In terms of finance, Stephanie, I've got a PhD student who's looking at um, pensions governance, which is, as you will agree, one of the most significant industries. And the um, trustees of pensions are having this terrible problem Problem where legally they have to they have a fiduciary duty mm. but along the road is coming um, CSR is coming the environmental environmental social and governance issues and suddenly they don't know how to balance the fiduciary duty yeah. against these other goods and they're going how on earth do we do that so oh, oh we better have a conversation with our with our beneficiaries and they're starting to look, none of them have done a citizens' assembly, but they're starting to ask those, kind of, those kinds of questions about how can we engage our beneficiaries, given that we are going to have to make these decisions not based on economic interest. But in the, so internally within organisations, there are arguments that these kinds of assemblies can work. Of course, that's within the logic of the institution. Um, I would like to see these things... Um, I've got a friend who thinks we should have a citizens' assembly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, which would be set, which would be tasked with how to abolish capitalism. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but you know, th th I think these institutions, by their very nature, are cr can not always, but can create small centres of independent power. And I and I uh, and I will hold to that. And I think the important thing about it is trying to link them into existing governance structures and that's why I think the relationship between independent bodies and these is a really interesting potential dynamic or nexus. Does that, does that make sense? On that last point Stephanie, the also you may be, be familiar with a very interesting project going on by the Royal Academy for the Arts here on deliberation on the economy. They yep. just published a book if you, if you google it, it's, it's on deli citizen deliberation. It's the, on it's the RSA Citizen RSA Council. RSA City Council. Cit on cit citizen RSA Council. Citizens Council, yeah. Very interesting. And, and when we heard them speak recently at an event, the, they said that the Bank of England was thinking about bringing citizen jury processes into the Bank of England. No, they've, they've, they've actually commit, they committed publicly to establish them in their regional, regionally. 
in order to in order to inform Bank of England policy. Yeah. And IDS has been doing some very interesting work. If you also talk about investment, there's all this social investment, impact investment language that's going on now of philanthropists who want to do good. Rarely had they consulted with the people whose lives they want to change. Yeah. And we've been proposing different participatory mechanisms they could use to get beneficiary voice linked to impact investment. So you could imagine this kind of process where people whose lives are supposed to be affected by investments having a say-so in whether they thought it would make a difference. There is, there is of course, the danger of that these, in, that these modes of engagement can be co-opted. Exactly. Yeah, so that's the danger. Yeah. That's, the, that, that's, the, that's the balancing act. Anyway, experimentation is happening. So let's get two questions here, but let's see if there's any more from the audience and then we'll come to here. So. Let's, let's go here first and we'll come back to. Hi. I'm saving the old generation. I'm letting the older generation. Um, my name is Asha. Um, I might be quite simplistic in my, in my thinking. I really appreciated your talk. But offices for future generations sounds like a great idea. But what about the actual education of those future generations? A lot of the times, I mean, I, from personal experience, Going to school in Scotland, we didn't get taught anything about politics or about constitutions or anything like that. We actually had to, if we wanted to learn about it, we had to take a module, you know. But I think it's really important that it's something accessible to everyone, especially at a younger age. So how does that tie in with your democratic framing and trying to include everyone? Thank you. Great. Thank you. And Richard and Robert, um, last, last comments. <laughs> I'd like you to comment on the SDGs as an example of a 15-year result that came out of a very three-year participatory process, and also in very different, the IPCC, uh, 1,200 scientists who've actually given us a lot of the awareness of climate change. Um, where do they fit within uh, your frame? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ro Robert, um, uh, this has been about as thrilling um, um, a, a lecture as, as I can remember. Oh, thank, yeah. thank you. That's and, very kind and, of you. And this is, this is <laughs> because, I mean, what, what you've done is you've, you've opened up a whole range of, of possibilities. And I've, and I've got, and, and that the, the, they're perhaps rather improbably, um, Continuing. Actually existing, yes. And existing and, and looking as they, they may themselves be sustainable. Mm. Um, so I, I've got two, two questions related to this. One is um, whether there are a range of others besides the ones which you've mentioned, which either exist or might be, might be made to exist. And I mean, thinking as you say, out of the box a little bit. You know, could, could there be one person appointed, perhaps from outside, to every parliamentary select committee whose job is to represent the future? And what effect that might have? I mean, that's just one example, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. is there a range? And yeah. is there some way of convening, or maybe you've done it already, a lot of brainstorming about what the range of possibilities may be? Mm. And the, the second question, um, is how can we find out more about this? Have you, have you, have you actually been so busy that you haven't been able to write it up? Or have okay. you, well, there is a book, I mean. yeah. No, there isn't a yeah. book. But there will be eventually, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean... <laughs> it's one of the bizarre things. I've got a book on long-term, the long, democracy in long-term, that's been, that's been delayed by short-term bureaucratic commitment. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be good to know how we can find out more. Great, thank you. So, Graham, why don't you take those three, and then I okay. think we'll, our time will be. So, Asha, I think education. Um, so, you can't you can't talk about everything within a within a, a, a single lecture. One thing I'll say about these bodies. So, I think I, I'm not going to talk about um, education um, generally. Um, but one of the things I really like about these uh, mini publics is they take people as they are and then take them through an education process. Education is absolutely critical to, to these mini-publics. So 
I think, of course, we've got to do all this work uh, in schools in terms of bringing people up to date with issues around sustainability, around long-term thinking. But it, given the context we're in where people haven't been and aren't in their daily life, what these, what these, what these institutions we do, we do, we're crafting a space within which you can learn about the different perspectives on this. Perspectives from competing advocates and experts, perspectives from fellow citizens, and that's actually something we never have the chance to do. And one of the, rare, one of the things, when we did our Brexit assembly, and we made sure there were more leavers than remainers in it, most, most of the comments we got back were saying it was delightful to talk to people who had a different view from me, because I don't in my everyday life. I talk to people who are like me and, and I choose my friends because they're like me. So you're actually creating a space where you're, for, you're forcing, you, you know, people enjoy it actually, you're, 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 they're creating that space for diversity, for interaction between diff, across difference. And I think that's absolutely critical and it is a really important learning process in itself. So, I, so I, I'll just hold that there. Um, the question about the SDGs and I, again, it's only part of, I can only, I'm only giving a cut through this. I think they're really important. I've actually argued the case, or I've seen other people argue this case as well, that IPCC would have really, could really have done with some really interesting public engagement, particularly when it was doing, when it works on its more social and political aspects. So I think, I think there are actually interesting ways that these, even these international bodies mm. can do better public engagement, rather than doing these exercises where the government comes in and reports, we did this public information campaign and this has gone out to every household in the country and we've asked them to send back things. I actually think you probably get more value out of convening two to 300 people over a, over a longer period of time and actually integrating that within decision-making processes than you do with public information campaigns. And things. So I would say these are complementary and they can work together in very different ways. Well, but that's very kind of you. Thank you very much for your, for your comment. Um, one of the things I've known, a couple of um, corporate bodies um, that I've heard of in Scandinavia, and I'll try and find the reference for it, have an empty chair in their, um, in their uh, mm. board meetings. And the, that empty chair is apparently for future generations. And now it's very symbolic, but actually sometimes you have to be symbolic. So I think there are a range of really interesting potential experiments. In terms of the, have I had time to write this all up? I am an academic, of course I haven't. Um, <laughs> but I've tried, we're, we're trying to collate some of this stuff on the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development site. There is no, so if you just Google that, Google FDSD, and there are, you know, the, the work that we've been doing with, um, um, what's it, with the House of Lords is there, the work that has been done in Wales is there, when we try and linking through to these other things, so you will find stuff up there and occasional things written by me. I've, the most recent blog I've written about is that, isn't it interesting that Climate Rebellion are talking about democratic reform, you know, so there's a blog up there about that. And you can sign up for a newsletter, which we, we don't, we, we are, we haven't got a huge amount of money, so we only send newsletters out every so often because we're, we're, we're board-led. There was one other question which someone said to me about, is this just about democracy? What about authoritarianism? I am not making the argument that authoritarianism would deal with this stuff better. The record is obviously it's quite clear that it doesn't. What's interesting, and we were talking about this earlier, is, is that within authoritarian regimes, some of these institutions are starting to be used. Some of them are being used in manipulative ways, as in ways of, you know, of, of, um, of, of shaping public voice in the interest of the dominant elites. But in China, for example, they're starting to use these locally in order to hold local officials accountable who are proving to be incredibly corrupt that the party can't hold accountable. So actually they're creating participatory mechanisms like PB, like these kind of citizen councils, etc., as a way of democratically controlling the local official from the party to ensure they do what they're supposed to do. Now I think this is really interesting because this is, you know, democratise that local democracy to assure accountability within an authoritarian regime. Wow, now that's that I didn't expect to see. Now what's going to happen out of that? I have no idea. That might, this might be a way of better social control. I am willing to say that that is one way, one way we could read it. You could also read it as the potential seeds for future democratisation. I, I leave that to, I leave, I leave that to uh, empirically, we're just going to have to see what happens there. Great. Well, before we give a round of applause, um, let me just mention that you might want to add Graham. Graham's also be a, been a key founding member of a, of a large-scale Wikipedia called Participedia, which documents participatory governance experiments around the world. I think you've got about a thousand case studies on this website now.
And uh, those of you working on tape, term papers, wanting to look more at participatory governance, come to Participedia. Participedia.net. Yeah. And if, you, if and also you can put up if you do, if you're doing a case study of a particular participatory initiative that that no one else has been studied that isn't up there, why not why not put it up there? I, I know this sounds incredibly instrumental, but you can add it to your CV that you've contributed to a global research project. <laughs> <laughs> not trying to sell it or anything. <laughs> And we'll have the privilege in June, June 11th through 13th, IDS is hosting the global meeting of people doing this kind of work, the Participating Network. Um, it's about 60 scholars from around the world who are documenting participatory practice and governance. And Graham will be back then along with many others and we will hopefully during that week do a public event where some of the people who are at Archon Fong, Graham, others doing this kind of work around the world. And the theme of that will be um, participatory innovation in times of populism. Yep. So come back to see Graham then. And Graham, thank you so much thank for you. coming today. Thank you. Thank you.